Hello Internet, and welcome to another episode of That's All I Have to Say About That Supreme Court Saturday. As always, I'm your host, Stephen Mackey. Today we're talking about DACA, or the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Now, it's not exactly breaking news that Republicans and Democrats don't see eye to eye on this issue, but recently it seems the best solution to people illegally residing in this country is shutting down the government. <laughs> Foreigners, you can't take our jobs if there are no jobs left to take. Now, a lot of people are approaching this question from a moral standpoint. Should you be splitting up families of people who are here illegally, or should the fact that they're here illegally warrant deportation? <laughs> yeah, I'm not even poking that one with a 10 foot stick. Instead, I want to provide an objective legal framework for understanding DACA. This episode is going to be a little different than usual because I'm going to do only one case, a deep dive into a case that I think almost perfectly mirrors DACA's current legal predicament. And now the Supreme Court is expected to weigh in on DAPA and DACA. Ah yes, DAPA. The Casey Affleck of Obama Deferred Action Executive Orders. Today we're talking about 2016's United States vs. Texas, which saw the federal government defend DAPA, or the Deferred Action for Parents of Americans, to the Supreme Court. So let's get a little bit of background on this case. On November 20th, 2014, this was announced. If you've been in America for more than five years, if you have children who are American citizens or legal residents, if you register, pass a criminal background check, and you're willing to pay your fair share of taxes, you'll be able to apply to stay in this country temporarily without fear of deportation. This gave illegal immigrants with legal children not citizenship, but safety from deportation or arrest, which Republicans handled like an android on Star Trek. Everything Harry tells you is a lie, remember that. I am lying. You say you are lying, but if everything you say is a lie, then you are telling the truth, but you cannot tell the truth because everything you say is a lie, but you lie, you tell the truth, but you cannot, for you lie. Illogical, illogical, please explain, you are human, only humans can explain their behavior. Yeah, we kind of fried the legal minds of a lot of people with that executive action. This passage led to, four hours later, the ironically named Freedom Watch, who were maybe not on Freedom's side with this one, helping Joe Arpaio sue the federal government for damages against his county of Maricopa, which apparently he preferred completely empty to full of illegals. You are announcing tonight that you are filing a lawsuit, or at least drafting one and planning to file a lawsuit against the president, arguing that this executive action is unconstitutional. Why? Why is it unconstitutional? Well, that's up to my lawyers and the courts to decide. Now, this case never made it to the Supreme Court because when you sue for unconstitutionality of something, but your explanation is, eh, I'll let the lawyers figure out the reason, you're not going to have a good time. He tried to sue for injuries to his county, which isn't really constitutional, and his argument was found to be more speculative than anything. So why mention this case at all? Well, this case, Arpaio v. Obama, is the case that some believe gave Texas and 25 other states the cojones to sue the federal government over DAPA and DACA expansion, something that they didn't do with 2012's passage of DACA. And you didn't think liberals could hate that guy anymore after the Trump pardon. So let's go to court. Today, viewers, you are my jury as I present to you the arguments and precedents. Don't worry, this case ended with a 4-4 tie. Yeah, sorry about that, Justice Merrick Garland. So no matter what side you end up on, you're not wrong. Although, I'm pretty sure the jury of your peers, aka YouTube commenters, will disagree. Here is the question. Does DAPA violate the Immigration and Nationality Act and therefore the Take Care Clause of the Constitution? Now there are two critical pieces of evidence that I will need to explain before I can take the stand, your honor. Don't worry, I'm not keeping the accent. First, let's look at the Take Care Clause, or Article 2, Section 3 of the Constitution, which says the President shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed. And I think most of you can probably imagine how this sentence is going to be a pain in Obama's neck. Next to the Supreme Court case that influences this decision, 1999's Reno vs. American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee. Yes, Reno is so hipster discriminating against Arab Americans before it was cool. This case is a little confusing though because it sounds bad for immigrants, but it might legally be DACA's saving grace. 
or it would have been before Trump. A group of legal residents claiming that U.S. Attorney General Janet Reno had targeted them for deportation because they were members of an unpopular group. This decision led to the Supreme Court passing the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act, which, as you can probably imagine, was not too helpful for non-U.S. citizens. This act said that non-U.S. citizens couldn't sue an attorney general, a member of the executive branch, for their decision to deport a non-U.S. citizen. Now again, that may sound bad, but this MUD's viewed by some to be moving discretion over deporting unauthorized immigrants to the executive branch. So now, the moment you've all been waiting for. Let's lawyer up. We will hear argument today in case 15674, the United States versus Texas et al. All right, first I'm going to be representing the United States, which believes... The Secretary of Homeland Security has decided to defer removal of the class of aliens who are parents of U.S. citizens and LPRs, have lived in the country continuously since 2010, and have not committed crimes. Yup, those watching this in video format have just learned why this is going to be my mom's favorite episode of Supreme Court Saturday. Anyways, let's get to the arguments. First we hear... Parents of citizens or LPRs giving them identity cards that say low priority. And would there be any difference between that and what this uh, DAPA guidance does? That is, that's a very important point, Justice Ginsburg. That, <clears throat> that is precisely what deferred action is. Deferred action is a decision that you were, that you are a low priority for removal, and it's an official notification to you of that decision. Essentially, the U.S. isn't letting people off the hook for being here illegally. Rather, they're trying to prioritize the deportation of criminals before they start splitting up families. You know, so that we're kicking out illegals who are bringing drugs, crime, and are rapists, and leaving the sum that we assume are good people. This coupled with the fact that if Congress really wanted to deport everyone, they would provide the funding to do so which they haven't, forcing the government to need to enact some form of prioritization. Either that or chase around a random and small subsection of the illegal immigrant community. It's like playing whack-a-mole but with people's lives. The next American argument was... Texas agrees that, the, that DHS has the authority to defer removal of this class of alien parents of U.S. citizens and LPRs. They agree that that judgment's unreviewable. What we disagree about is whether, principally, whether we also have the authority to authorize them to work and to accrue some ancillary benefits based on that work. The argument here is that DAPA is similar to the existing laws governing immigration. The Immigration and Nationality Act, because it denies federal public benefits to DAPA recipients. And states have the right to opt out of providing similar benefits as well. Now this probably makes DAPA sound super unappealing. Not only do you not get any benefits of U.S. citizenship, but the government won't even help you leave. <laughs> now it's time for me to lay out the long and complicated arguments against DAPA, starting with... I have to ask you about two pages in your reply brief. On page 16, you quote the guidance that says uh, the individuals covered are lawfully present in the United States. And less than a page later, you say... Aliens with deferred action are present in violation of the law. Now, that must have been a hard sentence to write. I mean, they're, they're, they're lawfully present, and yet they're present in violation of the law. Oh, man, you see how this can get confusing quickly. So how is one here legally and illegally simultaneously? Well, the term lawfully present is a legal term to define a certain status that, for the remainder of this trial, the federal government was offering to remove. If DAPA was a video game boss, these two words would be the flashing red weak point. Secondly, and this point is incredibly important in understanding the argument against DAPA, we see... If an employer uh, took the position that uh, the employer was not going to hire a DAPA beneficiary because the employer believes that they are not that they are not lawfully authorized to work, would, pre would prefer someone else over them, could that person sue uh, on any theory of discrimination, for example, under Section 1981? Uh, they could, Your Honor, and, and the outcome of that case, I think, has not been clearly established by precedent so far, but it would be a clash between folks with concrete interests, an employer who wants to hire someone 
not the individual who's Well, if that's them. true, then DAPA gives them a legal right. It's more than just uh, uh, putting them in a low-priority prosecution status. Remember how it was argued that DAPA didn't give people rights so it's consistent with the existing immigration laws? Well, that was just wrong. You get certain employment rights, which entitles you to certain social security rights, and before you know it, these people are contributing to society instead of living on the fringes like legal illegal immigrants. Now, to some, that might sound good, but it is inconsistent with current laws and also legally questionable because their mere existence here constitutes a breaking of the laws. It is also argued on the same lines that this is an unprecedented issue because it creates a second class of citizens. DAPA is unprecedented because this is an extra statutory deferred action program that is not bridging lawful status. The aliens do not have a pre-existing status and they don't have an eminence. Basically, if you take the DAPA route, you're not going to be ever a legal citizen and unless we catch all of the criminals who are here illegally, which yeah, good luck with that one, you're not going to be an illegal citizen either. This means that you're just going to float around in some sort of bureaucratic limbo until someone either kicks you out or takes you in. This DAPA program also breaks current laws set by Congress saying, Congress has passed a statute that says if you are living in this country without legal authority, you cannot work. That's Congress's policy judgment in 1324A. I mean, the executive this would, may disagree with Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I understand the point. I, well, I guess I'm just saying is this would be an enormous change in practice. Illegal immigrants cannot legally work in America which is great for employment and our thriving heroin industry, but completely spits in the face of DAPA because deferred action legal illegal immigrants can work, which again raises the question, are they legal? Again, nobody really knew. It's like Schrodinger's cat. You're legal and illegal at the same time until you're being interrogated by an ICE agent. The second argument was, What we're doing is defining the limits of discretion, and it seems to me that that is a legislative, not an executive act. So all of the cases, you know, the, the briefs go on for pages to the effect that uh, the president has admitted a certain number of people and then Congress approves it. That seems to me to have it backwards. It's as if uh, that the president is setting the policy and the Congress is executing it. That's just upside down. This was executive overstepping. Normally Congress passes laws and the president enforces them, but in this case Obama passed the laws and asked McConnell to enforce them. Kind of like trading places except nobody learned anything. This argument got even more intense when it was brought up that Three years ago, the executive asked Congress to enact legislation that would have given it the power to authorize most of the people that are living in this country unlawfully to stay, work, and receive benefits. And Congress declined. Now the executive comes before this court with the extraordinary claim that it has had the power to achieve the Excuse same me, end was that a, all along. Was that yeah, he tried to get Congress to do this, but they said no. To which Obama responded, I'm sorry, I can't hear you over my approval rating. At that point, he passed it through executive order, which kind of confirms the whole suspicion that this was not what Congress wanted. Now, you may be wondering, what about what happened in Reno with the Arab? Well, when the executive is forbearing from removal on a case-by-case -case basis, that is what this court in Reno noted was deferred action enforcement discretion. Oh, woof. In a weird twist that was debated at length, it was decided that engaging in case-by-case -case exemptions for immigrants by the executive branch was okay if there was no other benefits added, but the group protection has been yet to be decided on because that would be way too simple. A final point that was discussed and of interest was, If all they wanted to do was say we're not going to enforce as to you, the only memo they would have issued is the enforcement priorities memo. Because in order to qualify for DAPA, you have to already not be an enforcement priority under the enforcement priorities memorandum. What the executive wanted to accomplish was something more to say, not only are you not an enforcement priority, but we want you to be eligible to work and to receive benefits. 
The Department of Homeland Security, in the same year as DAPA, had updated their immigration enforcement program to have three tiers, prioritizing gang members, national security threats, and your bad hombres as number one targets, followed by a second tier that had committed multiple misdemeanors or seriously abused the visa waiver system. Third was non-citizens subject to final removal warnings. And then you have all of the other illegals existing in the one time when it's good that the government doesn't want to prioritize you. While illegals in this case would have still had the looming threat of deportation, the fact that this tiered system already existed made people think that this bill was more about giving illegals rights than about protecting them from deportation. In fact, there is one super revealing moment in the DAPA case. I really did want to know, just take out the work authorization, take out the Social Security, and take out that phrase. Can the, can the government say to all of these people, and say it all at once, not one by one, yes, um, uh, you, you are a low priority, all of you are low priority, and we will not be coming at, after you, and we will not deport you unless we change our minds. And Justice Kagan? They can do that, and they can do that under the unchallenged prioritization memo. But what they can't do is say it's deferred action that grants a status. Democrats, you almost did everything you said you wanted. You just had to keep going. I rest my cases. So what ended up happening? Well, you know it was a 4-4 tie, but... I want to go back now uh, to that Supreme Court decision on immigration. The highest court in the U.S. is evenly divided on the issue of immigration. It means that President Obama's plan to provide a path to citizenship for more than 4 million undocumented Americans will not take effect. When the Supreme Court ties, it defaults to the Court of Appeals decision, which was that this was unconstitutional. So what does this mean for DACA? Well, if you're a dreamer, you better hope that it doesn't go to the Supreme Court because Donald Trump's tie-breaking justice isn't exactly in support of illegal immigrants. The next step for people who want DACA to be permanent is to get it through Congress, which really contextualizes. What about a clean DACA bill now and with a commitment that we go into a comprehensive immigration reform procedure? Two days ago, it was reported that the Trump administration is turning to the Supreme Court over a federal judge's ruling on DACA. The Justice Department asked the Supreme Court to review a lower court's decision blocking the White House from ending the program. Now that might sound great for the future of DACA, although that court case did take place in San Francisco, a city where I think the judges might have had a little bit of a similar interpretation of the law inconsistent with judges from across the country. Even more importantly, the ruling was not based on the merit of DACA, but rather said that DACA needs to stay alive until litigation, aka Congress stuff, is resolved, which knowing Congress means that DACA might be around for years. For more information on DACA, keep listening to That's All I Have to Say About That Supreme Court Saturday. Thank you, and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I hope you enjoyed that last video. For more episodes of Supreme Court Saturday, click here. Please like and subscribe, and if you really are a fan, you can join our